Okay, welcome everyone. So I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Sebastian Alvarado, who is, uh, uh, has a PhD in molecular biology and he did some cool stuff in the real sciences. For example, finding out uh, if you look at ants in an ant colony, you see big and small ants and how to do feeding actually this comes about that some of them grow big and small. Um, and so during his PhD, he also um, had a second life um, earning money as a game tester in a, uh, a game uh, studio. And what he realized during that time is that uh, the people that design games, they want to make good stories and they're also often grappling with how to get the science right, right? And he saw there's a tremendous opportunity of actually do consulting for these game companies. And so he formed a consultant company to exactly do this, basically um, pair up scientists with game companies and making entertaining stuff that is kind of real. And so uh, we are very fortunate to have him here today and he's going to talk more about that. Thank you. Um, so yeah, thanks for having me. Um, just like Ingmar mentioned, you know, we, we started our roots were in the video game industry and um, we, we found ourselves kind of branching out in the last year or two, pretty much since, since I came here to Stanford. So we also do you know, film and, and you know, exhibits and things like that. Um, so this talk is more of like an exploration of the design process for a specific project that we're working on, um, a game, and uh, also kind of explain you know, why I do science and why it's important to advocate science. Um, so wh why do I do science? Um, at a very young age, it was pretty straightforward. Uh, I wanted to make dinosaurs and have superpowers. Um, <clears throat> there's something you know, really kind of interesting about this because most people won't admit this. Uh, maybe this is the truth, maybe it's not. But for me, the very, very early age, it was all about science fiction. Uh, my investment into science was based off of science fiction. There were incredible things that existed in the space. Um, and I thought that they could come true. Um, but more to, to my disappointment, I, I did learn more about the scientific process and, and what it takes to actually you know, get through that. And it pretty much came down to three very important themes for me. Um, I had my curiosity. I had questions I wanted to ask and I wanted to figure out how to answer them myself. It was the technology that allowed me to answer these things. And, uh, and thirdly, it was, it was the the possibility of discovery, um, to find something that nobody's ever found before. It was my own form of you know, treasure hunt and, um, and reward. And you know, this is pretty much what brought me through my, my own career uh, in science. So doing molecular biology, studying ants, fish, um, you know, cancer, and things like that. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but more, more specifically, you know, it also introduced me to this journey that maybe some of you are very familiar with. Um, and it's the idea of, you know, seeking out academic endeavors. And, and there's this nice little figure that, you know, came up, I'm sure people got in their email boxes a while ago, talking about what it is to get a PhD. And I kind of want to bring it to you and show you that, you know, if you were to consider the circle, the whole amount of human knowledge that exists, um, this is about how much you get after grade school, how much you get after middle school uh, and high school how much you get at the undergraduate level, so kind of increasing your, your broad knowledge. Maybe you minor in physics or biology, so you kind of, you, you, you start focusing, you start reaching out a bit more. <coughs> Perhaps you decide to do a master's degree, you, you kind of want to focus in and, and familiarize yourself with your, your field. Um, and then you catch up on all the scholarship that's required and all the work that's done in a specific field, specific point in time, or across all of our history. And you, you become, you know, the expert. I know everything there is to know about molecular biology, let's say. And then you invest yourself into the actual process of increasing that knowledge base. And then, you know, you push, you push, you push, and you make a little bump in, in that circle. And you call that a PhD. Um, and, I, and, you know, I, I did this, and I really enjoyed, well, I didn't enjoy it. <laughs> uh, I thought it kind of sucked. But I really, um, you know, value what I have now because of that and, and the knowledge that I, I've kind of gathered from all of this. Um, <coughs> this, was, this was kind of my dent. And uh, there was something that I realized that a lot of people kind of end up getting it. Other people, you know, don't want to do it because they don't want to waste that time. Um, but for me, it was something very different. I like doing it and I want to do it because I felt that <laughs> in a very silly level, I was at the level of the cells. I was interacting with them. I was holding them in front of me. Um, I could see them dancing with each other when, you know, cancer was happening, when development was happening. So for me, it was something more tangible that I felt when I was studying biology. And it actually had nothing to do with school or, you know, taking courses and getting grades. Um, so my dent, <laughs> my dent was this. My thesis project was about 
breast cancer, but if you really want to read the title, it's the methylated DNA binding domain protein 2, coordinate silences gene expression through the activation of microRNA, HSA, MIR 496 promoter, and the breast cell, cell <laughs> cancer line. Um, yeah, so I, I didn't know what to think of that. You know, even today, I, I kind of look at this paper and I'm like, oh, you know, that's good. I, I made my dent. It, it's important for me. And then, of course, um, <coughs> four people on, on applause saved it. That, that's good. Um, and, and I got 1,394 views, which also made me feel, you know, oh, maybe my work is important. And it probably is. I mean, there's no denying that we need to do this type of work. It's important. And we need to kind of find these small connections in what is a very large spider web of understanding a given disease or understanding bi biology in general. I have to admit that probably 1,393 of those clicks were from my parents and wife, very proud parents and wife. Um, and as you know, Igmar had mentioned, I kind of then got sidetracked in, in this little project, which was seeing how the entertainment industry perceived science. Um, it kind of sucked. Um, there are good examples out there, but for the most part, <coughs> it's not that they want to make these unbelievable you know, science fictions that have no basis or premise or anything whatsoever that would make them even plausible. Sometimes that's not the point. But sometimes they just weren't informed. Um, they didn't have that type of knowledge base to, to explore and do properly. Um, so we kind of started doing you know, science for entertainment. Um, there was one video that we did for a specific client. Uh, we did this with Victory Hill and Marvel. Um, maybe you've heard of Marvel, Captain America, and things like that. They wanted us to make the Super Soldier Serum. And we made this one little video where I went over you know, DNA repair, genome editing, uh, epigenetics, uh, metabolism, and all kinds of big, big ideas, broad, broad, broad ideas. <coughs> and uh, on the other hand, you know, we got a, about 120,000 views within the first month, um, which was, you know, kind of made me look at my applause paper, uh, looking at breast cancer, and looking at this and saying, Maybe I picked the wrong career for myself. Maybe I should do this popularizing science and you know, focus more on that. And uh, it kind of made me think about it a bit more and think about what it takes to kind of engage an audience, uh, specifically when it comes to abstract concepts like science. It also kind of introduced me to the responsibility that we have as academics to engage our public. Um, this is really, really important. I feel that it's never emphasized enough in, in our own training, our graduate training. Uh, but it's, you know, we have responsibility to explain ourselves because uh, that's what we're doing anyways. We're discovering things. We have to be able to explain them. One reason, um, these are taxpayer dollars. There are people attacking it, um, thinking that we shouldn't be spending money on these things. Uh, maybe some of you recognize here, this fellow here, um, who thinks that we're burning dollars by doing scientific research in, in a variety of different fields. Um, he just simply doesn't understand a lot of these, uh, you know, the reason why we do these things or the peer review process that goes into it. But we do have to share, you know, what we, we have to defend ourselves. Uh, in addition to this, we have to culture critical thought within the public. Um, you know, 42% of Americans reject the idea of evolution um, and will we'll buy into something else completely different. Um, you have climate change deniers in, among Congress. And uh, this is kind of scary because now we're kind of being responsible for our actions at a more, you know, worldly level. And then on a more positive note, um, for those of you who aren't familiar with this gentleman, this is uh, was James Flynn, and uh, he kind of described this interesting effect, <coughs> which was the fact that every decade since about the 1940s, we've been getting 10 points to, to our IQ um, as, we, you know, as we develop across generations. <coughs> and this was done with IQ testing um, that were standardized, and you had to re-standardize them every year. So people were getting smarter. Um, they're getting better at, you know, um, formulating logic on top of hypotheticals and abstract thoughts. So, you know, we're thinking more outside the box. So there's almost an audience for it. So in addition to being able to explain the budgets that we're using um, and culture and critical thought, that is happening kind of naturally with, you know, the development of our own society. So there's a good reason for all of this. Um, <coughs> By the way, if anybody has any questions or wants to jump in and yell at me and say, no, you're wrong, Sebastian, go ahead. Um, this is the choir. This is the choir. Okay, good. <laughs> um, so this kind of brings me to my next question. I want to do science and I love doing science um, and I want to engage people through media. Can we do science through engaging media? Um, and this is probably a theme that's going to come up quite a bit. 
um, in, in our seminar series, specifically with games and interactive media um, this, this at Stanford. And, uh, you know, in a way, yes, there's this really interesting idea of, um, there's this interesting idea of, you know, doing citizen science. Um, this has been done uh, quite a few times and has been done to really cool effects. Um, we've been able to make scientific discoveries by taking people, typical average people, uh, giving them a game and asking them to solve, what, what, you know, an abstract problem, which in fact, you know, is rooted into some sort of biological concept. People are solving protein structure with fold it. Um, they're figuring, they're tracing neurons and how they're wired within the brain and the eye and the optic nerve um, with eye wire. And, you know, you're also figuring out how the small molecules that exist in every single cell are being folded, um, you know, through a turna, which is actually being made here at Stanford. And hopefully you'll get to see the talk on that too. Um, what's really amazing about all this is that you see folded players acknowledged in the authors, eye wires, um, and a turn of participants. These are all the players. So these are, you know, kids. Um, your grandparents, your parents, people that may not necessarily be invested in the science themselves, but are still doing the science, um, you know, almost effortlessly. I think, was it one of the top folded players is either a piano player or, you know, it has nothing to do with biology. Maybe that's the good, that's, that's why it worked. That's why they figured these things out, because they're not biologists. <coughs> okay. So, if I kind of bring you back to that figure that I showed you a bit earlier about, you know, what it is to get a PhD and, you know, what it is to do, uh, to, to kind of take that voyage to increase the limits of our knowledge, you kind of find these players that are just having fun, you know, outside of that space. They're playing with these abstract ideas and they're helping us, you know, increase the boundaries of, of this circle. And I, I think that's just a really wonderful idea, but does that mean that an Eterna player is, you know, a good nucleic acid chemist? Does it mean that a folded player is a good biochemist? Does it mean, you know, eye wires are good neuroscientists? Um, <coughs> yes and no. In one way, um, they're not necessarily taking the same type of training and rigorous, you know, exploration of scholarship and literature that other people are taking. Um, in fact, you know, they're skipping all of that and they're just jumping to the fun part. But on another hand, they are getting a tangible feel of what it's like to navigate a three-dimensional space, or a two-dimensional space even, of, of biology. And, and they do this naturally, intuitively, and, and this is just good game design and, and very interesting um, you know, phenomenon that's kind of happening and people are picking up on it and it's really turning to something very fascinating. So you have, this, you have players basically working this abstract space um, that we built for them and they're solving questions for us. Um, so this kind of brings me to my next point, which is can we accelerate the learning process through games. So people, you know, learn, um, I actually I would say any game is a learning exercise. Uh, so given that, you know, I'll, I'll give you one small example here. Uh, maybe it's familiar. I hope it is. Um, it's, it's Mario. Um, <clears throat> this is, I guess, a lot of people would say this is, you know, game design 101. But <laughs> every game, even if you're playing or if it's just a you know, people see it as a toy or, 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 or an interactive experience for a child. <coughs> it is a learning exercise in itself. So, you know, when you start looking at Mario, uh, in fact, most of the game, Mario is always at the center of the screen, but the very first screen that you see him in, he's at the far left of the screen. So you have this open negative space in front of him. Um, what does that make you feel like doing? Going to the right. Going to the right. And, and that is like the number one biggest rule that you have to learn throughout this game, always traveling to the right. When you start moving to the right, the first thing you see is this little question box, this unthreatening box with a question mark, um, something to motivate you to move forward. Once you move forward, you see the Goomba, this threatening little object moving towards you. Um, at this point, you're taught the game's first mechanic, or second mechanic, instead of moving right, is to in fact jump. Um, if you can't jump, you can't make it through the rest of the game. And basically, there are these little lessons scattered throughout any game level that you, you kind of encounter in, in these spaces that you kind of have to learn a rule, learn how to take advantage of that rule, and find exceptions to the rule, which I would say is you know, a learning exercise in itself. And as you kind of move forward throughout any given level, you, you see that these 
challenges get harder and more difficult. You have to jump over larger obstacles. You have to cross more enemies. You're given examples where it's safe to fall, examples where it's dangerous to fall. And ultimately, you're rewarded by a little flag that you can jump to at the very end. <coughs> so it's basically pairing a lot of reward with a lot of learning. Um, so if every level in, in a game is a learning exercise, I would say, argue that you know, you know, every power-up um, or you know, reward that's given to the player is also you know, uh, a lesson in itself. So you get given challenges within a game, a barrier that you can't necessarily cross, and you get given a reward, which is, let's say, a power-up, a, a boomerang that you can be given, a sword in this case, and a link to, was it, uh, Legend of Zelda. Uh, and this then enables you to move forward through the game, to take on new enemies, to find new strategies against those enemies, and of course, learn. Um, so, what about games to learn? If really our enjoyment uh, and you know, the, the action of play is, is based off of learning the rules of a system and then exploiting those rules and, and you know, moving forward towards a goal because you're playing with those rules, why don't we have these great games like Mario for, for education? Um, and we do. Uh, perhaps some of these are familiar to you. Uh, there was pretty much two games that I grew up with grew, uh, as a child, and one of them was, you know, Oregon Trail, um, where you kind of explore the history of Oregon and, you know, the old colonial states, I guess, and Number Munchers. And I don't know if I liked them, actually, because they were the only games we were allowed to play at school, but they actually kind of presented this idea that, you know, educational games, especially down the road when you look at them, they're not entirely the best games out there. They're not the you know, number one commercial successes. Um, you have games like Grand Theft Auto <laughs> and all these you know, AAA developments that, that really kind of put out these amazing games that everyone will buy and put their money into. And whether it's you know, a lack of availability or, or the fact that people think that you know, if you're forced to learn something, y you're not necessarily enjoying it as much, um, all of these factors might play into the fact why we haven't had these shining stars of educational games. Um, there's a lot of problems, I guess, you can say with the designer that wants to design a game and you know, the, the educator who wants to teach a lesson and, and rarely finding common grounds. Um, so another point to, I guess, bring up on all of this is that a lot of these educational games are pretty much targeted between you know, kindergarten to grade 12, because apparently you stop learning after you, know, you graduate high school. <coughs> um, I would actually say that it's everything that kind of happens after that that gets really, really interesting, and those are the lessons worth teaching. But again, this is just me kind of you know, discussing this with the room. Um, in addition to this, because of that you know, discordance between designers trying to design a good game or the game they want to make, and you know, educators trying to create a lesson, you have a lot of these kind of broken designs that come into play that are very common with these educational games. For example, pacing is often broken with you know, Sebastian the Scientist. You know, you're about to finish a level and Sebastian the Scientist will interrupt you and say, did you know that Calcium is rich. No, no, no. And you'll have some sort of little blurb that pops out in this, you know, scripted event that always kinds of breaks, always kind of breaks the uh, pacing. There's also a lot of purposelessness, right? Um, does it matter if Number Muncher, you know, gets a multiple of 20? Um, will he be able to see his wife and kids afterwards because they're holding them hostage because he's not eating enough multiples of 20? Do you know what I mean? There's no purpose. There's no meaning. Um, to a lot of the decisions you make in these kinds of games. So I think it's really important to kind of find that purpose and, and that design. Um, so, just, just an aside there, um, does that mean games can't be educational? There's a really neat paper that kind of came out recently that took games that are purposely made to improve your cognitive skills. This company might look familiar to some of you. Hopefully nobody from the company is here right now. Um, this company that creates these little brain games that help you improve your ability of thinking, um, your cognitive skills, and this really awesome game, you, everyone should play this, um, Portal 2, which was really made for the, you know, the hardcore gamer, um, the PC gaming community. Um, and, and they basically found that when you took players and gave them each of these games or each of these exercises to go through, that one game basically excelled at uh, improving a player's cognitive ability you know, with a handful of behavioral tests and another one didn't necessarily make any difference at all. And I'll tell you right now, it was, it was Portal. Um, now Portal is this game, it's this funny 
um, narrative driven game where you can control physics within you know these little puzzle rooms and uh, it, it kind of gave you an example of this is a game that made lots of money for, for Valve uh, it's a game made by expert designers and it was just a good job <laughs> um, probably there are some very talented people working at Luminosity but it doesn't, didn't necessarily deliver the same type of promise that this game didn't even make um, so I'll bring you back to maybe one of the reasons why, why I play games. Um, it won't surprise you to fight dinosaurs and to have my own superpowers. But that was more growing up as a kid. Um, thankfully, I grew up and I stopped playing these games pretty much when I finished graduate school. And uh, we're kind of treating games as a new medium. Things have changed. Uh, there are games that are coming out now. One example is Gone Home. Perhaps some of you have heard of it. It explores sexuality and coming of age by letting you explore an empty house. Um, there's this other game called Kentucky Route Zero. Um, it's a surrealist, you know, uh, back highway adventure that's incredibly atmospheric and ambient and people have been comparing it to, let's say, a David Lynch movie. Um, there's that Dragon Cancer, which is a game that explores what it's like to be the parent of a child who's dying from cancer. Um, and then there's also, you know, probably one of the first examples of these, you know, abstract approaches of making new types of games is uh, The Graveyard, which is actually you know, a five, 10 minute game where you walk through a cemetery um, towards a bench and you're this elderly woman. And if you pay for this game, uh, I think you can randomly die across that 10 minute voyage. And really it explores death and you know, what it's like to be old and, and to struggle with life. And um, it's kind of brought about this idea that we're not dealing with games anymore. We're more dealing with a new medium. And we have to explore the different extremes of, of making games, or not even games, but making interactive media, um, just like we did with music, film, and things like that. <coughs> so this kind of brought us down in our company and the work that we do down to the fact that we want to make a game. This is an exciting space. We have exciting knowledge. We know things. Um, we're scientists, and we would love to make a game that was pretty scientifically accurate. When we first started working with Thwack and picking up clients you know, like Marvel and Warner Brothers and things like that, everyone said, nobody wants to have a scientifically accurate game. It would suck because you know, Mario would die from gravity immediately. He would never be able to jump that high and, and you know, it would really, really be bad. And then the first reply that came to all of those comments um, was, well, nobody's ever made a scientifically accurate game before. Um, so maybe it would be something worth exploring. Um, so we wanted to take up that challenge. Um, okay, so what kind of game do we want, want to develop? We were a group of academics, so we wanted to deliver science at a graduate level. We knew that the educational space was largely dominated by half-decent games, let's say, uh, from the K to 12 level, but we wanted to start presenting abstract ideas that people maybe have never even heard of before if they heard about them they don't necessarily understand. It's a mystery. It's like magic to them. Um, we also wanted to have easily available source material. Um, if we were going to explore a concept in biology, we wanted it to not be this newly discovered disease that nobody's ever heard about. We wanted to explore something that's you know, been rigorously studied beforehand. We wanted to make it relatable. We wanted to affect everyone um, in one way or another. We want people to understand it. They want, we want people to be familiar with it. And more importantly, which is I guess you know, the whole topic of, of this discussion, is we want it to make it conceptually playable and we want it to take the lessons that we can learn from source material and design games around it. <coughs> so what did we pick? We picked cancer. We wanted to design a game where the player would learn the lesson of walking a mile in someone else's shoes. We wanted the player to basically slowly become cancer in a game that happens uh, in, a, in a human patient. Um, is it rigorously studied? Uh, you, you better believe it is. Um, having, come in, having come from the field of cancer, or at least studying at the molecular level, um, you, know, you have multiple fields that pretty much intertwine cancer and help us understand it, um, and then a bunch more. Um, so we know that there's tons of source material on this. We know we have experts on this. I mean, I understood at a molecular level, but we know cellu I, like our company you know, houses cellular biologists. We have neurosurgeons. We have several surgeons, actually, that are you know, helping us consult on this. 
and they're helping us build this experience. Is it relatable? Um, it, there's a social cultural impact for cancer. Um, I think this is probably the best way to illustrate it right here. Uh, if you were to just count the number of Time Magazine covers that have explored uh, you know, what it is to be cancer, uh, or not what it is to be cancer, but how humans have dealt with cancer over time. And it brought up something really interesting for our group um, and what we wanted to build. And we started realizing that, you know, in addition to cancer being this very rigorously studied um, disease that we want to answer, we want to understand, we want to solve, we want to cure, uh, it had a lot of very interesting language surrounding it. Cancer was this unstoppable force that we had to wage war against. Um, the war against cancer, I'm sure many of you heard about this before. People demonize cancer, they say it's evil, we have to fight it, we have to win against it. And it, it brought up you know, this interesting discussion between our members of our group where we started thinking that, well, it's not that it's a demon or it, it's Satan growing inside of you or anything like that. Um, we, felt, we felt that that type of thinking and that type of uh, understanding of the disease actually helps you, well, it doesn't help you at all. It, it kind of renders you a bit more helpless to, you know, what, what the disease can do to you and, you know, how you would see therapy. <coughs> so we wanted to kind of dispel that idea that, you know, this isn't you surrendering yourself to evil or not having control over anything, but it's something that's a biological process and we want people to understand that. So we started, uh, you know, abstracting the disease so we could design a game around it. Um, one of the first things that we realized we had to do was decide if this was gonna be a three-dimensional or a two-dimensional game. Uh, we decided on a two-dimensional plane because pretty much all the cellular microscopy that's been done in the last hundred years uh, has provided us with ample amount of source material. Whether you're looking at individual small cells uh, at a very microscopic small scale level, or you can see individual cells, or whether you're exploring different tissues, um, you can build cancer in any of these. For those of you that are still kind of wondering, it's a matter of growing cells and transforming them and then having them invade and conquer other types of territory. Um, in addition to this, the availability of histology. So the fact that somewhere there is always going to be a picture of a slice of your flesh, um, not yours, but the slice of human flesh at any anatomical and tissue specific level meant that we had a lot of our level designs figured out for us. We didn't have to work that hard because we knew that if we were going to make a level in muscle, we would have this type of cell structure to follow, to, to obey, and a lot of physics to obey as well. We wanted to explore the idea of cancer being dynamic. Um, there's a genre of video games that are actually called 4X, and they're all about exploring, expanding, exploiting, and exterminating. Um, for us, we felt that when you're a single cell and you decide to become cancer and you want to surround you know, a specific tissue or grow or divide, you, you need to know that space, so you have to explore it. Um, there's this idea that if you were to zoom in the camera angle to just single cell space, you would be able to then grow within that space. And as you grow, you basically explore uh, and you increase your angle and view on, on uh, a given level. Um, obviously, you have to expand. Uh, exploit the way cancer cells grow. They basically steal resources from the rest of your body. Um, and of course that leads in a lot of death. So we started kind of developing this game design and we started wondering what kind of game designs work on this conquering type territory. Um, what's the simplest example of a game design that you know can explain this space and, uh, and at least lend itself to the same two-dimensional planar level design that we're after. Um, for those of you not familiar, there's this game called Go. Um, it used to be on, I think, Mac called Reversi, and it's you know this old, old Japanese game where you conquer territories using, or not conquer territories, but you basically win the game by making moves that allow you to kind of grab one piece at the end of the board by you know having an, an encircling type of game design mechanic. I'll show you an example of this right now. Um, so in, <coughs> in Go, you know you have pieces on a, on a um, on a grid, and if you take the piece just outside of that, anything between those two pieces gets conquered. So for us, we started thinking, well, because cancer behaves in a way where if you have so many cells adjacent to another cell, it starves out that cell and then kills it, perhaps we can make a design similar to Go um, that obviously has a far more dynamic, far, more, far less turn-based, but far more quickly adapting to uh, 
a changing level. Uh, so an example of this would basically taking our grid and then forming it around these cell structures that we would see in normal human histology, and of course placing our pieces in that space, um, which then loaded, led us to prototyping. So some of you may be familiar with this already in prototyping a game. For those of you that aren't, um, you have to kind of think of creative ways of prototyping a level or thinking about how it's going to feel and how it's going to work. This is an embarrassing little video that I made when we first started making this game uh, where we had to explain our ideas together and we figured the biggest problem with all of this and talking with the programmer and talking with uh, you know, the other designer is that nobody understands what I'm saying and I don't understand what they're saying. So we had to find you know, common grounds to, to understand what we wanted to create. So we made stop motion videos uh, using buttons and Kevin, the other designer, was using coins and pennies and quarters and we were sending videos to each other where we would basically, oh, oh, is this playing? We would send videos to each other where we'd say, okay, you know, each of these red buttons is a blood vessel. Um, these blood vessels will release little immune cells that will come and try and conquer cancer. And it forces us to work in this two-dimensional space. The cancer is the yellow, uh, and these buttons basically grow and grow and grow every time they conquer a blood vessel because it's more nutrients, it's more resources for the cancer. And we kind of started experimenting and playing with this space without actually even picking up a you know, computer or coding just because we felt that this is the easiest way to explain this. Um, so, you know, this is just one idea that we had um, for how we would, you know, explain how gameplay would work. So, you know, goals within this game would be getting close to vasculature, uh, getting close to blood vessels, and, and being able to, you know, sequester the nutrients that come from those blood vessels so that way you can increase your ability to divide and grow. Um, I think it's over. Is it over? This actually took a lot of time, <laughs> uh, learning how to do stop motion. Uh, and then a lot of silliness too because I wanted to see if my designer was still paying attention and, and our progr programmer uh, was still paying attention. I said, did you see the part at the end? And they're like, no. And it's like, you didn't watch the video. Um, another really interesting aspect about cancer is that it's heterogeneous. So these are lessons that we wanted to deliver through our design. Um, we didn't want to have Sebastian popping in saying, did you know that cancer is heterogeneous? Wearing a lab coat and a little tube with nothing in it. Um, we wanted people to intuitively feel kind of like the way people play through Super Mario. We wanted them to just explore that space and, and, and understand it intuitively. Um, cancer, uh, a lot of people will tell you, is a genetic disease, uh, or not genetic as in you're inherited, but basically when cells start dividing and they start dividing too fast, um, the machinery that keeps DNA replicating makes mistakes. And the more mistakes it makes, the more mutations you collect. So we decided, okay, let's abstract this idea that every mutation, similar to actually what happens in real cancer, gives you a unique type of an ability. Um, so as the game progresses, you start off as a single cell that explores, or that's basically forced into a corner where the only way out is to divide um, and to invade. And <coughs> as this happens, the more you divide, the more you invade, the more challenges you come across that have to do a lot with scaling within a tissue. Um, as you divide, as you grow, you obviously will increase these amount of mutations. So you increase your likelihood in a purposeful way, in a meaningless, meaningful way, to develop new types of mutations. Now these mutations are our power-ups. These are the reasons why we can conquer new types of territories, at least in our design. Um, the capacity to divide faster, the ability to invade, to cross over tissues and cells that you wouldn't otherwise be able to cross over, and of course rate of growth. And there's maybe a list of 10 more of these that were slowly either tossing or implementing into our game, uh, et cetera. Uh, cancer is also still very heterogeneous. Um, you can have a variety of different cells that get different types of sizes that can be illustrated in a variety of different kinds of ways. Uh, this is just an example from a paper of how we are approaching the way we'll explore the space in addition to representing the histology that exists within human tissue. Um, and this kind of brings us to Next theme that I kind of want to explore, and it's narrative. Um, I mentioned that you start off as a single cell. Um, most of you start off as a single cell as well. Uh, we figured there was an extra opportunity to teach lessons about cell biology. Um, when you take something like a stem cell, we decided you're going to be a stem cell. You're going to be an individual cell that has the potential to become all of these other types of you know, cell lineages and derivatives, but you would be given the unscientific here. Uh, I have to 
you know, protect my own career as still being a scientist by saying this is not scientific. But the ability to de-differentiate and move in and out of the abilities that are presented to you early on in the game. What we wanted to do is explain to the player, well, you know, this is what biology is like in a normal human being. Um, you start off as a stem cell, or let's say, you know, the player will start off as a stem cell, but stem cells start in your body and have the ability to become different cells in your body with different functions. And we want the player to explore what each of these functions are, specifically in the immune system. We want to know what it's like to be a T lymphocyte, a B lymphocyte, to produce antibodies and cytokines, things that, you know, attack an infection or if a tumor starts to grow, to attack the tumor. So we want to introduce them in basically the first act, regular cell biology. We want to introduce them to the environments they'll be playing in. We also want to introduce them to what ultimately becomes their enemy. Um, these are the cells you have to fight against at one point, and you will know how they work by playing through the first act. Again, giving purpose and meaning to these things. Um, the second part, obviously, is the first act is kind of just exploring what it's like to be a you know, multipotent cell. Then you get cornered. Um, the idea of getting cornered is that we introduce the game mechanic of being able to divide um, without a cap. So being able to divide to, let's say, get out of a tough spot. Um, usually when a cell's purpose is fulfilled and they have nothing else left to do, your, your body will, will kill them. You, you know, you'll, you'll have cell suicide and, and this is a normal process. But a player doesn't necessarily, a player wouldn't identify with what is regular cell death. Um, if anything, um, it makes sense to the motivations of somebody playing this game to actually survive and to explore what it is to divide and to grow and proliferate and survive more than anything else. Which is when we start taking that turn towards what it is to be cancer. Um, you transform. Uh, you, you get this ability to form a tumor to grow this large cell mass. And in doing so, you start collecting these little mutations that can then form larger and larger cells. Now there's an extra mechanic built into all of this. When you have to manage more and more cells, it's far more difficult to assign them more and more functions. There's micromanagement issues, which is part of our mechanic. We want to make this game more difficult as you become a more aggressive cancer. We want to empower you more, and we want to give you bigger challenges. And then of course, Act 3 um, is chemo. Naturally, any patient undergoing any type of growth or cancer um, would have to eventually come to this chemotherapeutic stage where they have to be given drugs. Uh, drugs which, in fact, target all of the, ability, all of the abilities. Uh, each of these abilities that we want to develop through different mutations can be easily targeted by each of these drugs. So just like we gave you these powers, we found an easy design mechanic where we would have drugs that actually exist that target cell replication, that target the ability to grow, that target the ability for a cancer cell to, let's say, get, the, get to the vasculature of a cell and take away that power and challenge them. Um, so this is, kind of, this is kind of what we're doing right now. Um, we're building it. I can show you, you know, a quick tech example of, of you know, what we've built so far. Um, it's nothing particularly fancy. In fact, most of these games, the very early stages are kind of rough around the edges. But, uh, you know, we've started exploring it. More than anything, we want to map out the physicality of the space, so what it's like to be a cell that needs to explore space, uh, really get a feel. It, that's what I want people to do. I want them to feel what it's like to be a cell, um, what it's like to be, let's say, a tumor that needs to cross over space, um, what it's like to be these cells after metastasis and after they've gone into the blood and after they start circulating in your, in your, your blood vessels, and what it's like to basically you know, interact with all these other aspects and the physics that exists within inside every single tissue. I don't know what Radosh did there, <laughs> but um, it, it's, it's basically exploring that space. So understanding it from a very completely different angle, but in the same way, giving you the journey that gets there and in itself being a lesson in what it is to be a cell, what cell development is, and also um, what, it's, what cancer is, uh, for that fact. And I'll just end on one last part, and it's basically the art. Um, it's important for us that the game's very pretty. First thing that we wanted to nail down was the physicality of the space that we want to explore. The next thing is the art. Um, so I'm going to show you kind of an example in these types of lessons that I want to create. Um, have any of you heard of immunofluorescence hands on? 
There's, a, there's a few of us. I, I know there's some biologists in the audience. Immunofluorescence is this technique that we use to label different parts of the cell. Um, we'll have a specific protein that we're interested in, let's say on the surface of a cell, and we'll develop an antibody with a small fluorophore attached to it. So this is something that will give off light uh, that will stick to it. So what you can do is you can molecularly label little parts of the cell um, and they will glow for you if you hit them with different types of light. Um, there's a lot of different ways you can play with this. We do it in the lab all the time. Um, I could explain this to you like I just did, like anyone would um, in, in a you know, university classroom about cell biology and things like that. Or in our game, we could actually just show you what it's like to explore that space. And one thing that we realized is that there's this beauty that exists um, within cells, within the methods we use to look at cells that never really gets explored. Um, or never really gets the attention that maybe it, it deserves uh, as art or as, you know, for a beautiful aesthetic. And what's very interesting about this is that in those abilities that I was talking to you about, that each cell or each lineage of cancer could get or that the player gets as they go through the game would give them an indication of what cells have those abilities. But the thing is, though, is that you would not be able to see it with the naked eye we would introduce this as a mechanic for adding aesthetic beauty to our game, but in addition to that, labeling which cells you can use as you get larger, as a tumor grows, and as it gets more and more difficult to micromanage multiple cells at once. So we have an extra dynamic that works into the aesthetic, that works into the game's design, where we're gonna create dynamic lighting. This is actually not, despite you know, how pretty it looks, it's not too difficult to do. Um, to create cells that will just bright up different colors or that will light up with different colors um, when you just click a button. So we're creating this mechanic right now. Um, this is definitely you know, one of our core features that we're going to include. And uh, I'd like to end on just one last thing. We talked about cancer. Um, I talked about cancer and you listened. <laughs> that doesn't mean it stops with cancer. Um, I can easily come up with an equal amount of ideas, you know, in, in the neurosciences, in, you know, if you were to take something, let's say Alzheimer's, and take this exact same journey. Uh, I feel that there's this unknown world, the reason we like watching nature documentaries and science documentaries, to just explore and to understand, and which is the reason why, you know, I'm curious as a person, and I, I, I do science for that curiosity. Um, the reason why we use these really cool tools like immunofluorescence and the same reason why, you know, we make these discoveries. Um, we'd like to take the idea and maybe not even do cancer and do maybe a hundred games about a variety of different diseases and communicate these to, you know, a younger audience um, or an older audience for that matter um, through, through game design. Um, so in ending, of course, I'd like to say I couldn't have done any of this by myself. Um, our, our team right now is three people. There's myself, uh, there's Kevin Nybert and Rados Jovanovic. Um, Kevin is, was uh, a nanotech uh, ace. He then became a medical writer and now he's a game designer in Montreal working for Toot Games. Uh, Rados is this programmer who's pretty much been able to do every single thing we've asked him to do. So, uh, and he puts up with us. And uh, he's working at Voxel Farm. And uh, again, if it wasn't for these two people, we wouldn't be able to create this game or make it what it's hopefully going to be one day. And then, of course, last but not least, um, there's me, this guy. Um, if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. <laughs>